is a little after six o'clock. I call the October 26, 2021 select board meeting to order, um, seeing no one in attendance for our six o'clock public comment period. We move to the uh, 610 item on the agenda, Director of Public Works, Karis Lustig. Superintendent, how are you? Good. Great, nice to see you. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to present on a couple of different topics. Um, the first one is on the um, impending renovation of the town common, which we have scheduled for the summer of 22. Um, I presented back in November of 2020, our conceptual plan for that project. And we've been going through the final design process and permitting. There are two changes that are um, aesthetic and functional in nature that I wanted to bring to your attention just to make sure that there were no concerns with these, um, these changes. The first change is to the um, cantonary lighting that um, was originally proposed to be temporary to be set up on the green. Um, we investigated different options for temporary poles, and we found that there really was no suitable product that would be durable, easy to remove, and then easy to seal the holes and keep mm -hmm. it safe. So instead, um, when we worked with the designers, we looked at permanent poles, and you'll see that these poles are actually integrated into the shade structure, so they're removed off the green and onto the shade structure, so they no longer would um, interfere with mowing or other items that would happen on the common. Um, and it would allow us to keep the Cantonary light up um, all year long, or we could take the string and the lights down and the pole simply become part of that shade structure. Um, so I just wanted to notify you of that change. The second change is in the um, seat wall for the back of the common that faces the town hall. Um, and initially that was gonna be one uh, level um, wall, but we had an issue of trying to figure out where to locate the sound system that we wanted to integrate into the common. So where we would put microphones and other equipment so people could actually use the sound system. So what they had proposed was to basically build a little podium into that seat wall that would have a cabinet built into it, which is where the um, sound equipment would sit. Um, so it just changes a little bit the visual um, and the use of that back wall. And those are really the only two substantive changes that we've had since the last time we talked on this project. Okay, thank you. And I'm assuming that would be waterproof and tight for the yes. equipment. And would that be seasonally put there or something that would be there during the winter? Is it just, have we thought about that yet? How I think it was for permanent, but for I will permanent. confirm. Okay. Um, questions or comments on the changes? Yes, Ms. Cooley. So I have a couple of questions um, related to the, the lights looks like a great change. I understand that one. The podium question here, um, if we still wanted to use a podium from up on the steps of town hall, will that still be an option is question number one. We talked at one point informally, at least, I don't know if it ever made it to you about putting Wi-Fi out there. And one of the aspects of putting Wi-Fi out there was so that we could use a sound system that included an app for audio enhancement for people in the audience. And so I just wanna make sure that we keep track of that as a criteria for the sound system so that we are able to do that because it seems so often we're out there and we have a program that's a marvelous program and people can't hear it. So um, the first question about the podium is the podium is portable. So it can be relocated to whatever part of the common or um, if you wanted to do it on the town hall steps um, that you wanted to have your announcement or performance. Um, and I will um, have to follow up with our IT department on the Wi-Fi. Uh, the scope of this project didn't did not include any improvement on the Wi-Fi to the common, um, but there was improvement for the electric lighting and sound system. And that improvement in the sound system included a criteria of thinking about audio enhancement for people or not? Because I do think that creates a difference. Um, I don't believe it did. So we okay. will certainly go back and have that conversation. Great. Further questions? I, I guess just to clarify, because that podium to me, you know, I'm thinking kind of the limited use 
and it's great to have it, but is that, are you saying that that can actually be removed or moved? It's a, that, that section is portable. It's not built in. No, it is built in. It's sort of okay. a built in cabinet to the structure. Okay. Um, so the structure is permanent, but there'll be a wheeled cart underneath it. That would be movable. I see. So the wheel cart would be movable and then, um, and that could be moved around the site. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, thumb sideways, I should say, on it, but I think if it benefits the common and there's no objection to it, you think that's the best design to get some uh, AV uh, out there, then, then that would work. Um, any further comments? I, Dan? I, I guess I just have the question, for you, would you be planning on keeping the equipment in the cabinet all the time or taking it out? So or, I, or moving it to storage at various times? So I will confirm, but I believe the intent was that that would be the permanent location for the equipment. Yeah, I guess if that, as long as it's secure, I think that's a good thing, but it might, it might be better um, because there are long periods of, of, of time in a, in a, in a monthly cycle that there's no, you know, at various times for many hours, there's no one around there. So. Yeah, Marcus. Yeah. And then as far as the winter plan with all the equipment and storing it and things like that, I know it's set to stay there but is there going to be covering or is it going to be you know boxes or like storage for those things or would it stay in there the whole entire time like out you know whether it's rain i know all the weather we can't predict but i think about a long winter if we have one when this is done how would that affect the long-term use of this and um you know the long-term um yeah the long-term use of using these products or these um this these uh, systems in place and you know would it a road faster if we don't take care of it in the winter time and things like that. So I can certainly inquire. I believe the space is supposed to be weather tight, but I can yeah. certainly inquire, especially to um, temperature fluctuations and yeah. making sure yeah. um, what that impact would be on the equipment. Absolutely, because you know, replacing it if we're saving money long term, I think that is important as well. Good. Thank you, Marcus. Marianne. Yeah. No, nope, I had actually a similar question relating to temperature fluctuation on the sound equipment. So. Great. And, and I guess I will just close with this. You know, I just want to make sure that in this space, when I think of the common being used, I think of the steps being used, as Marianne said, and then for uh, Memorial Day, we go out by the flagpole and, you know, that's where uh, even, you know, that's where the festivities occur. So I just want to make sure that, I guess, if this is in place, that maybe we'll have to try to reconfigure some of those um, places for some of the events. But um, just some food for thought. Marianne? I was going to say, just I don't know if there's a place on the town website for the town common upgrade, but one of the things that I was thinking about as I looked at this presentation is it would have been great to have just an overall picture of the common again to orient mm -hmm. ourselves with this. Mm -hmm. So I hope if we have it on the website, like if everything's in one place, would be great. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next item which is talking about Sinos of traffic regulations, Dedham Avenue. Um, so this is a request that came into the TMAC um, from the neighboring residents. It was evaluated by the committee and voted on to be moved forward um, with. And this is to um, place no parking signs on a portion of Dedham Avenue. Any questions? Is there a motion? I would move the... the uh recommendation for traffic regulation on Dedham Ave. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, well, Ms. Cooley. Sorry. No. Nope. Karis, can you just explain for people who are listening, there is a process that these kinds of changes go through. Maybe if you could just cover that again, because I know there are folks in town who wonder, mm -hmm. how does somebody get this to happen? Sure, we have a traffic management advisory committee that meets um, their uh, schedule and I believe their application is also available on the website. Um, anybody who is interested in any change to the neighborhood that they're in, oftentimes the requests are crosswalks, stop signs, parking, no parking signs, um, speed limit issues. Uh, they put their request into the traffic management advisory committee, which is made up of both town and um, uh, town officials and residents. And they go through each request and petition, um, evaluate it, and then make a recommendation to the select board based off of that petition and the merits. Um, and then um, the select board will then mm -hmm. vote on, um, on those particular petitions. 
and I will just mention that the, the TMAC, the Traffic Management Advisory Committee, does have an opening right now um, and is looking for volunteers from town. Yeah. So, very good plug in there. And Marcus. Yeah, and just a quick question about when you talk about sidewalks or other things, you know, where that falls and how uh, I guess it's a little more complicated to get more sidewalks than it is for stop signs, just for people that don't know that and what that kind of process or priority level looks like. If you can explain that, you know, comparing the two, they're two totally different things, but. And there's more, I guess, um, more in-depth um, reasoning for the sidewalks maybe not being completed as far as the stop sign. So I think, more the, right. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think the, the main focus of the Traffic Management Advisory Committee has been more to do with um, how traffic pedestrians and other items intersect, not mm -hmm. necessarily with pedestrian mobility. Um, so the requests tend to be more about um, infrastructure related to how those two items interact. Um, the sidewalks uh, requests, we're looking at addressing more holistically with a new committee that I think is in the process of being established to really look at the committees that we have and what purview they have as far as um, we have a committee about um, public transit, we have a committee on um, traffic management and sort of how they interact with the public works department and our priorities. Um, when it comes to sidewalk, we have in DPW set a priority of maintaining existing sidewalk before we end up um, adding to our network. Um, we have done a condition assessment and um, even though the town does put together a budget to invest in our sidewalks on an annual basis, the sidewalks are very, very expensive to reconstruct. And so effectively we end up find, falling behind and having about a 25 to 40 year maintenance cycle for our sidewalks, which they don't last 25 mm -hmm. to 50 years. So we basically go through and evaluate our, um, our sidewalks, our road work, and look at um, predominantly uh, business areas, school transit, um, and decide how to look at our um, condition index, and then use that based on those other criteria where to start our work, but we're hoping that this new committee can help to provide some direction on those programs. And especially as there is um, desire in many neighborhoods to expand walking, I think, especially since the pandemic and people have become more accustomed to walking and experiencing their neighborhoods, I think this committee will help us set priorities as we move forward. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Okay, any further discussion on this item? Uh, just a little bit. I had Damn. not read the whole motion because I didn't have that page okay. open at the time, although it is posted. But the motion is to approve and sign a notice of tra traffic regulation that uh, uh, I, it, it has the number P211026 for Denham Avenue parking prohibited on the west side from 260 feet north of Webster Street to 290 north of Webster Street. And the purpose, and that's the motion and the Along the lines of what Mary Ann was saying, the purpose of that is to address a concern of uh, some homeowners in that in that residents in that in that stretch that uh, traffic on the street, which is we all know is very busy, uh, parking in that particular place blocks uh, line of sight from their driveways uh, coming in and out, and so that was that was the basis of their request that went to the TMAC in the process. That Karis has described. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matthews. And that motion was seconded. Uh, thanks for clarifying the form of that motion. And for the viewing public, there is a um, diagram and a, a map overview in the agenda packet um, that notes the area of parking concern. So thank you for that information. Um, seeing no further discussion, we come to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you. Next, next item. The next one is a slightly different traffic yep. regulation um, re uh, recommendation. Um, unlike the others that typically do come from the Traffic Management Advisory Committee, mm -hmm. this one is actually being initiated by the Department of Public Works. Um, the town did a study, I think about three or four years ago, um, on pedestrian safety in the town. Um, and there were several results that came from that study. Some were very urgent, where the town ended up investing in several intersections, adding RRFBs, standardizing the type of crosswalk that we put in, and really making immediate improvements to these areas that were high risk. One of the other recommendations that was still important but not labeled as, um, as critical was establishing certain areas um, to be designated as safety zones 
that would have some additional um, improvements made. Um, in this particular case, we're looking at the area on Beaufort Ave that's adjacent to Perry Park. So there's a lot of um, neighborhood children who end up going to and from that park. There were some parking issues there. Um, there was really no established sidewalk on one side of the road and um, the crosswalks there were inadequate. Um, so this particular um, safety zone would complement the improvements that Public Works is currently in the process of undergoing in that neighborhood to um, designate that as a safety zone. I think I presented about this time last year on the original recommendation from GPI, who was the consultant who did the study to add um, green paint alongside an entire safety zone and both in public works and we brought it to the select board for um, guidance, uh, determined that a green um, edge line was not appropriate given the fact that there wasn't enough width in this particular location to have what would be legally defined as a bike lane, it's under mm -hmm. five feet, and that it wouldn't necessarily be um, helpful for um, improving the safety of this neighborhood. So instead we decided to do little um, uh, boxes, green boxes, as you enter the safety zone to bring somebody's attention to the fact that you're entering an area that um, is a little different than other parts of town that you would drive through. This also sets a 20 mile per hour speed limit in this location. Um, that is uh, different than our, our current regulation. So uh, passing the safety zone is what enables the town to lower the speed limit to 20 miles per hour. Thank you. And uh, I have some friends in this area, as we probably all do, and I know they'd be welcome to, to get this, most likely this reduction. My question is as far as notification, are they notified that these changes are coming before? I know with you know, other projects, there's a notification requirement. How do we notify these abutters or can we notify them of this work so that they understand what will be happening? So we have notified the abutters oh, and I believe that our highway department has held at least one, but I believe it's been more than one meeting with the neighborhood, right. um, letting them know about the changes that we'll be making. Um, there are certain areas where we are adding sidewalk um, and then there's an area where there's there's a little island as you get right to Perry. Mm -hmm. um, we decided not to wrap the sidewalk around the entire island because it enabled some additional parking. So we have been working with the neighbors. Oh, terrific. Great, thank you. Um, discussion. Yes, Marcus. And then I know it's when we do things like this, it's uh, however many feet to the left, right, or whatever. So is it the whole neighborhood and all the adjacent streets that are within a, what is the radius? Is it the radius that's kind of here um, on this document? Um, so I believe I have a picture of the entire scope of the project. Mm -hmm. And the, all those families and everyone were kind of notified. Anyone who's adjacent to the project, but yes. I do believe we've been doing work in that entire neighborhood on either end of the yeah. park. We've been doing um, road surface work as well, okay. in addition to this work. So we've been working with the neighborhood and okay. communicating with them. Thank you. And that's the map that we have that was passed out the site plan at our desk. Yes. Thank you. Marianne. Um, so are there other safety zones that we're looking at? I'm just curious from the study that was done a few years ago. This is, I think this is the first one we've actually implemented. And so I'm glad to see us doing that. I'm wondering if there are others. Um, there are others. I know um, the one that has come up to my attention most recently is Highland Ave. Um, although we are looking at a much more comprehensive project on Highland Ave going from the work that the state is doing on Webster to the town center. Um, but a safety zone would likely be incorporated between the Memorial Park and the businesses across the street. That was another area that um, was identified in that study and also an area that we, um, is, is under our, um, our list of priorities as well. Okay, great. And given that you're here, I'm just going to, and you talked about the flashing beacons, um, which was something that came out of that study that was done a few years ago in response to a pedestrian um, death actually on Webster Street. Um, I, I am going to once again implore parents, implore adults in the community, all right, to push the button. Um, I had one day when I drove down Webster Street a couple of weeks ago, three times, three people, one adults, two kids, one at dusk, nobody pushed the button mm. and they're waiting to cross and it's there for a reason. So I encourage people to use it. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Marianne. Any further discussion? Plus the fact that you should yes, press the button at least once to see how it works because it doesn't 
it doesn't have any give to it. So it was kind of surprising to me the first. It works great though. So uh, that's, that's should just go down and try it out, see how our new technology yeah, Try works. it out, and then, make sure you cross the street maybe when you, you do. Then maybe you can use it when you're supposed to. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion? Yes. I move the, uh, or was that Marcus? Yeah, Marcus I'll moved second, the board. I'll, second, I'll vote to approve and sign the notice of traffic regulation. Um, Permit SAZ 21 1026, requiring that Beaufort Avenue be designated as a safety zone between Hawthorne Avenue and Arden Street. Um, motion made by Marcus, there's second. Yes, second. Yes, second. Did you second? Yes. yes. Any yes, further second. discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, snow. Our favorite stuff. I know. <laughs> well, we have a nor'easter coming in right now, but yes. luckily it's of the non-frozen oh. variety. Um, so I, I do believe last year I came in front of the board as well to talk about our snow program and some concerns that we had in public works about how we were preparing for that program. Um, and I'm in a very similar position this year um, as I discuss it. Hopefully we won't have the same disruptions this year as we did last year with COVID where we had staff who were quarantined during our snow program, which obviously made it difficult for us to be able to deal with um, with the snow events that came in. Um, but we do have some concerns um, about both our ability to hire staff to replace staff that has left, as well as um, we have had several contractors who have already notified us that they do not intend to continue um, participating in our snow program. And that's been a trend and a pattern for the last several years. It's not just unique to the circumstances that we're in today. We found that there are people who are less interested um, in working snow. They're having a harder time getting staff who wants to work the grueling hours involved in snow. The amount of money that they make, I know there's a lot of perception that, that there's a lot of money to be made in snow programs, but it's very unpredictable. And so it's difficult for the contractors to participate in that program. And a lot of the equipment that we find that we're losing, unfortunately, is on the heavier equipment side, um, which is obviously harder for us to find additional um, uh, new uh, opportunities um, in that field. So I just wanted to give a little briefing about our snow program and how we got to this, I think, very strong place that we are today. And then also to set expectations um, for the upcoming year. So Needham has developed a program that basically relies 50% on town staff and 50% on contractors for our um, plowable events, really. So anything that's two inches or more, um, we have about a 50-50 ratio of town staff to contractors. And we set up our routes in town so that we have one contracted staff person and one town person on every single route. It gives us the ability to break staff without having to lose any territory. It allows us to keep our roads wider. It's been, a, and when equipment goes down, it allows us to keep our momentum. So it's been a really successful program. And I do think Needham has really been outstanding in our ability to keep our roads and parking lots clear. And I think that that is shown in our very few number of um, school off days that we have in Needham compared to other comparable communities nearby. So when I talk about having um, potentially right now six staff and six staff that we are down internally, um, and we've had I think five or six contractors indicate that they won't be coming back, we're really looking at a different model for our snow removal. Mm -hmm. And we're potentially looking at a model where we're gonna have one piece of equipment per route, which means if we have damage on a piece of equipment or when we need to rest our staff, there'll be a little bit of a delay. We still think that we're gonna be able to keep our roads safe. That's always our number one priority is to make sure that the roads are clear so that um, emergency vehicles can continue to travel to people's homes. Um, but it may mean that there's a delay in things like clearing out lots, sidewalks and other areas. And we might not be doing it as quickly as I think the Needham residents have expected. And of course I am in some regards underselling the program because I wanna set expectations. Last year when I did talk to you, we ended up getting several more contractors in place. And I think by the end of February, we were at full capacity. So we did have, once the season got snowier, we did have more interest in the program, um, but I'm just sort of reflecting where we are today. Um, we've actually just come out with our contract today for our contractors to start engaging um, them in our process. We have increased slightly our rates um, to make us comparable with some of our neighboring communities. We've also increased our incentive pay. Um, if you are able to sign up with the town of Needham, um, I think it's by the end of November, 
and provide all of the documentation we need, the registration, the insurance, and have your vehicles inspected. There's an incentive pay that you receive on the back end of, of the winter when you've performed for all of our snowstorms. Um, this is supposed to help the contractors offset some of the cost of insurance and registration that they incur to plow for the town. Um, we ended up indexing that with the um, plow rate for equipment. So that way equipment like loaders, which are more expensive to insure and more expensive to register, will have a higher incentive payment than a pickup truck, which is less expensive to insure or register. So we are um, in the process of recruiting. I'm sure you've seen the message boards yeah. around town, um, trying to get contractors to call us, regardless of their size of equipment. We would love anyone to call us and talk to them. Uh, if we have to have more pickup trucks because we can't have larger pieces of equipment. We might not have our roads as wide as we would like, but we would have them clear and that's really our main priority. Um, so I wanted to set expectations um, and then just answer any questions that you might have about our SNOW program. Great, thank you. And I know it's a problem throughout the Commonwealth and I've spoke with other communities and it's, uh, it's very difficult. So I like the idea of you know incentives and whatever we can do to, to try to get people in. Um, I did just have a question on our discussion that we had uh, at the state house zoom trying with the snow hauling and plowing trying to get them separate which which i think would give us or you know get some type of advantage uh or i know it would for us um has there been any movement on that as far as we know any discussion? not that i'm aware okay. we actually just had our bid um our three-year contract for our hauling services was out to bid um this year we were at the end of our three-year we have been lucky the low bid um, for the prior contract was a local contractor who plows for us as well, who happens to have relationships with a lot of our contractors and has on their own decided to engage most of our internal contractors in the hauling process. Okay. Um, and we had a bid opening and again, we have a local contractor. Okay. Um, so we have a contract in place for hauling. Oh, that's great. Okay, Marcus? Just a couple questions. Um, I know when we went through kind of our um, select board orientation when I first came on, we talked about um, looking at the routes and updating them. Where are we on the process with that? And I just didn't know as far as um, from when we started to now, I know that's something that was taken in consideration because it's been a number of years since we looked at the sidewalks and things like that. And then when you talked about some of the equipment, if it's damaged, we may be a little delayed. Do we have any backup equipment, you know, possibly ready to go? Or is there something that we need to do to be proactive for that? So um, on the sidewalks, we actually had meetings all through the summer, which is always a fun time to talk about snow, um, with multiple individuals from the school department, the police department, um, the town manager's office, public works, I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone. Um, and we ended up talking about our snow plowing routes. We actually worked with um, our new GIS system to be able to evaluate um, all of our current school buildings. We ended up looking at transit and a few other items to see where we are offering um, sidewalk plowing. Our current sidewalk system is largely built around school walking routes. That's been the primary um, motivation behind doing town run sidewalk clearing. Um, and what we found when we ended up looking at a one mile radius from all of our schools is that our schools are very well distributed across the town and all of our school walking routes were really within a mile of, um, of, those, uh, of those facilities. Um, what we were hoping we could do is we plow about 50, 52 miles of sidewalk. And that's really what our um, system is built up for. We have six main pieces of equipment and a backup piece of equipment um, that divides the town into six routes. Um, we found that there wasn't a lot of locations we were hoping. There were more locations that weren't within a one mile radius of a school. There were a, a couple areas on Hunting Ave that we decided um, didn't meet the school needs for plowing, um, but there wasn't miles and miles of road that we could then um, reallocate to another location. So um, barring a major change in our sidewalk program, our staffing, um, bylaws, something like that, we feel that our current routes with a few small minor modifications um, are really the appropriate ones for us to be doing with our current inventory. We are going to be keeping our sidewalk uh, downtown sidewalk pilot, which has the town removing snow um, in the evening hours in one section of the downtown to really see what the viability is for providing more snow removal. Um, but unfortunately, all the things I'm telling you about staffing and contractors mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily bode well for us providing um, additional services moving forward. 
Um, on the damage side of things, we do have a pool in house of equipment. We have um, heavy and light equipment that we have in a pool on our side. What we find more is the contractors, um, and when they have equipment that's damaged, it becomes more problematic because they often do not, they often provide multiple drivers, but they don't provide multiple pieces of equipment. So if one of their pieces of equipment ends up failing, it's often a loss to the program um, for that particular event until they can get it repaired for the next. Um, so the, there's redundancy on our side. Again, we think we can get one piece of equipment per route, but um, the contractors usually do not have redundancy. That's where the delay comes. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Further discussion? Um, I just will close with my two questions that have to deal with the RTS. Uh, first of all, the salt shed, is the plan, or do, do we anticipate any uh, supply issues with getting salt? I remember in the past, we'd, I guess we'd load it up, and then uh, of course we'd have to load it again if we had a bad winter. But, I'm uh, just wondering kind of the procedure how we're going to do that if we anticipate any supply issues and the swap shop up there I was you know told it was going to close and it was on the website and I guess there were some questions on why and I think that is snow related if you could just address those please. Um, so on the salt shed I haven't heard about anything specific to the salt industry related okay. to supply issues but I will certainly inquire as I think what's going on right now in the industry um, across all different yes. uh, uh, different items um, would make sense. So I will inquire on right. that. Um, the good news is we do have a very high capacity in our salt shed. So we do have the ability to stockpile quite a bit of um, salts in, in house. And I believe we filled up our salt shed at the end of last year. Okay. Um, so we're in a good place. Um, on the swap shop, um, we decided to close on a seasonal basis, largely related to the snow program. Part of it is because of the things I had indicated. We are very, um, can't say very short staff, but when it comes to the snow program, we have a really an all hands on deck approach. Our RTS staff, they actually work the overnight shifts with everybody else during a snow program. And then they come in the next day and they work the RTS. And then, then they also have to keep the RTS clear so that when it opens the next day, um, that, step, that residents can come in and use it. Um, so because of that, and also the location of the swap shop, so the swap shop um, is not in the best location for its purpose. It's right near the entrance, um, and we had um, the RTS evaluated a couple of years back, and it was identified as an area that we should look for improvement to relocate that particular facility. It's also located, um, because of the space issues at the RTS, it's located on the other side of the property from the um, bookshelf and the um, clothing item, which oftentimes if items are not accepted in the swap shop, that's exactly where people go to drop off their items. So a lot to allow DPW to really focus in on the snow program, we thought that um, having a seasonality to our swap shop would be appropriate. I think very similar to the conversations we've had about on-street dining and having mm -hmm. a seasonality to that as well. Okay. That's, thanks for that clarification. It's very helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Stay safe on this wet evening. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. Um, on the consent and appointments, I just want to note before someone makes a motion um, that the term expiration date on our agenda sheet um, should be June 30th, 2023. Uh, the two appointments in the packet, uh, signature packet are correct identified as June 30th, 2023, but it is incorrectly noted on our uh, agenda sheet. So if there's a motion to be made that date should be changed for both appointments. Is there a motion? Yeah, a motion that for both appointments, the uh, expiration date is changed to 2023. Okay, and you're moving the uh, appointments and consent? And moving the consent agenda. Great, thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Next item, town manager. So Chair, I, I would note, Karis and I had an opportunity um, over the summer to have a pretty in-depth tour of the RDF in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot uh, There's a lot we can learn from them and, and they uh, actually had a lot that they said that they would learn from us. Of course. But one thing we did learn is that their swap shop is seasonal. So <laughs> okay. um, just so you That's know good. that we're in, we're in good company if we, we do that and for very many of the same reasons. Great. Um, so the first item under our agenda tonight is to adopt the calendar year 22 fees. Uh, this proposal in front of you contemplates um, the continuation of the reduction in the liquor license fees for on-premises sale of alcohol. 
And um, the only other change, as the board discussed at your last meeting, the only other change is we've, um, we've consolidated the road race fee. It used to be a different fee if it started in Needham and left Needham, or it was all in Needham, and we found that there really was no distinction um, between the work that needed to be done to accommodate the road races. So there's just the, now the one fee at $25. So um, this, again, this plan does show the, the one year continuation for calendar 22 of the lower uh, alcohol licenses for our on-premises alcohol distributors. Great, thank you. And we've had some discussion over the past um, several meetings about the um, outdoor dining license fee, first with the public hearing, and then again, um, last meeting, and there's been um, some discussion on this board, and I would like to discuss it uh, this evening as stated in our agenda about waiving the outdoor dining license fee for calendar year 22. I did have a chance to speak with um, some restaurants in the area, and I know we're trying to balance the use of that space for versus the use of it for retail, and there is a cost of doing business. Um, but in my discussions, I know that with the equipment they need for the winter and maybe even extending the season, it would be very helpful for them uh, just for this year to have that waived. And I know that's brought up by uh, Ms. Cooley um, and it was discussed before Mr. Nelson. Um, so I just would like to uh, see what the no pun intended appetite is for, or maybe pun intended, for having that as an additional motion to the suggested motion. Discussion, Ms. Cooley. So I do think that that would be a good thing to do for this year, um, at least. And then I think we should take a look at it after mm -hmm. that and see where we are. Um, you know, people have, have continued to make investments in the furniture and in the outdoor amenities. So they're paying for those. Um, you know, if we look at the cost of an average, um, you know, the average setup with the three parking places, blah, 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 we're close to break even. Um, you know, if, if we were to do that. So at any rate, I just, I think for right now, it's better if we can just sort of stay put, let's roll it one more year mm -hmm. and then let's sit back and see where we are. At that point, I'm also optimistic that we might have some other communities that have considered this and we can see how other people are thinking about this as well. I'm sure people will be looking at what we've proposed since we're kind of out in front yes. on this one, but, um, but just to take a pause, I think would be good. Great, and I see it as noted, um, and we did ask for this information last meeting, the estimated impact would be $3,600 if we waive those fees uh, to the town. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I think agreeing with what Marianne said, and you know, for this year, especially waiving that fee, but for the future, seeing where we are reassessing maybe yearly to see how much or if we're gonna waive that or you know where we're gonna fall on that end. But I think it'd be more beneficial for the town and our businesses, you know, to continue to, um, you know, believe in them and making sure that they're as stable as they can be through this pandemic and going forward. But um, I think it's a good idea. And I, um, I agree that we move forward with, with this and adding this in or subtracting this going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? Um, so is there, um, Ms. Cooley? Could I ask um, yes. one more thing? Every time we look at these, this is miscellaneous licenses <laughs> like how many of some of these do we have they're always it's always an interesting list you know as i looked at like pool tables where did, in history did it come from that we licensed pool tables? For I, can, I can tell you that the licensing requirements are all in state law i don't know how many pool tables we have but i i'm thinking miles might know <laughs> Miles, was miles a pool? Miles. No, I did not know. What if, what if we get you a report at your yeah, next meeting? Right. It, it just, every time I look at this, I know it comes up and I'm like, where the heck do these come from? So. Why do I feel historically we'll find the bowl away or the other bowling alley we had in town had one at one time? But right. Not yeah, anymore. Yes. Yeah. That is good. That is good. Yeah. Well, yeah. Start with P in that. Brian P. The trouble. Trouble. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. Is there a motion um, for this fee structure as well as the waiving of the outdoor dining license fee for calendar year 2022? Yeah. I uh, motion that we approve the calendar year in the fee structure and amending it. So we are waiving the $3,600 uh, estimated $3,600 um, fee for outdoor licensing. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, we come to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you, Kate. Mr. Chair, that's, that's about a $50,000, maybe $52,000, $3,000 um, uh, amount that we would be foregoing for the liquor license. The next item for the board's consideration, feels like we're doing this every meeting now. Yes. We've created a lot of committees. Um, the planning board created the housing plan working group as uh, several members of the board know and are serving on. Um, and so um, we've asked that the board uh, designate the position of member of the housing plan working group as special municipal employee, and then um, we'll place the list uh, on file with the clerk and file it with the state ethics commission. Again, and I'll say it every time, members of the select board who serve on committees that have been designated as special municipal employees are not special municipal employees under the law. Correct. Is there a motion? So moved. I will second both motions um, related to the article or to the item. Designate the position member of the housing plan working group as special municipal employee uh, pursuant to general laws chapter 268A. Um, and that we place that list of special municipal employees updated in accordance with prior votes taken during this meeting on file with the town clerk to deliver a copy to the state ethics commission. Just to clarify, so it's a motion and a second. Thank you, um, Mr. Matthews, Ms. Cooley, any discussion? Ms. Cooley. I just wanna say that I really appreciate the process of keeping this up to date. I think that's a good process to have and I'm glad we're doing it. Thank you. Agreed. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Just before we move on to the next item, uh, Mrs. Fitzpatrick, I'm thinking as you're talking about the waiving of the, the fees, can we put a nice a letter from the board um, to these um, restaurateurs and let them know what we have done? I just think it would be nice when they open their mail because I don't see a lot of people watching this meeting. I know news does travel fast, but I think it's just really nice touch. And we could include the outdoor fee too. That's yeah. right. Assuming Thank it you. passes, yeah. Perfect. Okay, um, next item on the agenda, ARPA. So um, we have a preliminary uh, or initial American Rescue Plan ARPA funding proposal for the board. And um, we ask that the board uh, consider endorsing the plan, recognizing that we will probably be in front of you, could even be monthly, um, making adjustments to this plan because it, right now it is um, very new, the law is not settled and the costs are not always um, clear. So many of them are still under review by town council, but they're the items that the board has considered at several meetings, including those with the direct COVID impact. And those are things that we are looking at. Uh, some of them the board has already um, uh, recommended approval of, and the, those are the contact tracers, the epidemiologist and the public health nurse. And we're also looking at additional mental and uh, behavioral health staffing and um, services that would be likely services from Riverside or um, uh, agencies uh, like that. And we're looking for two years of funding for all of those programs so that um, we can run these programs through um, two years and then decide whether these are things the board wants to prioritize for putting in the budget or whether um, COVID um, impact has reduced um, the need for some of them. Discussion, yeah. Mr. Nelson. Um, just a question about those two last subjects and them being two years each. So it'll be about 95,000 a year. And then if we were to do that, um, I think we talked about it last meeting about you know giving more or in other instances, because this is just what we're looking at for initially. Like you said, if you come back monthly, we could, if we see, um, so see fit that we need to add more you know, money or finances, are we able to take from other pots and move money around with this? Yeah, without question. Yeah, without, okay. Yeah. I just doubled for yeah. people at home that yeah. see this and that yeah. are asking the questions. Yeah. This is not set in stone. The money can be moved and used, but it has to be within the ARPA exactly. guidelines. Yeah, within okay. the universe. Yeah. These are, um, for, particularly for mental and behavioral health, these are items that um, our youth and family services and aging family services have recommended. Okay. And so once we get started with them, um, we can bring them in and see how it's going okay. and what they think they might need. And we included in, um, in this category and other 100,000, just um, that is the that is the initial overrun if we wanted to make changes and then other items could be changed. With respect to technology, we are looking at um, support for hybrid meeting and uh, communications and remote work that would be um, in particular upgrading the wireless uh, ability in, in our buildings. Um, we can we can ask again about the question of outside. I don't know if that would qualify. And um, 
uh, town council is reviewing the, the possibility of staffing to support the technology work because like every everywhere else and i think probably one of the most um uh, staffing short departments with a lot of work is our it department right now so um it wouldn't if possible it would make the work easier to implement if we had staffing for that on economic development we're proposing the five hundred thousand dollar item we will have for you a draft grant program in the coming month. Um, this is something that we're trying to roll out very soon because we want the businesses who need it to be able to have access to it as um, soon as possible. Amy and Katie have been putting together um, a grant program that would have flexibility to it so that people could apply for certain things. They might retire, apply for retention bonuses or improvements to their um, built environment or um, uh, web access, anything that they could do to, um, to improve their businesses. We're also working with town council to determine whether um, businesses that went out of business and want to come back or new businesses could be um, in included in that. It also, this category also includes um, public art where artists have lost revenue, um, continuing the pop up uh, store program, which was very popular, and um, some business center marketing support, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in the time managers report. So that really leaves us the um, the capital that's uh, contemplated in the ARPA. The three projects that we've identified that we would um, for sure allocate uh, ARPA if the board approves this recommendation is to hire a project manager. I think this is something that the board talked to us about a couple meetings ago, uh, trying to get these programs implemented. Uh, we're, we're adding this amount this fast and the capital plan will require um, help a uh, new project manager for, and we are proposing for that for four years because in the capital project, the money needs to be committed in the first two years, but the work can go all the way to 2026. We're looking to allocate funding for the reservoir um, cleanup project. This is the dredging that's similar to that um, was done at Rosemary Lake. And this is the maximum amount that we might need to fund if we did the dredging the way we did it at Rosemary. We are looking um, with our design consultant and with our conservation commission as to whether there may be other means for doing this. So this number might go down, but having, um, this is a project that we've been working with the Community Preservation Committee on. And as you know, um, it's very much a, a factor and the Community Preservation Committee will be coming to talk to you at your next meeting about their plan, but it's very much an aspect of their planning, um, particularly lately that their, that their money is seed money or leveraged with other funds. Mm -hmm. And so it is, um, we were expecting not to be able to fund this completely through CPC. So this actually works out very well for us. And the, um, the Needham res Reservoir is a category five contaminated water body. And so um, would be very beneficial for us for our NIPTES compliance. And then finally Walker Pond category two, which is also cleaning up um, another water body uh, there. This was contemplated for funding in FY23. And if we, um, we can use ARPA for it, which we can, we could maybe perhaps get it um, on track and, and ready for its uh, potential construction season. The other items that we've that we've proposed are um, the major project that we have coming in the sewer um, area is the interceptor um, in the Greendale Ave area. Is that right? Thank you. Um, and this is a major project that could be anywhere um, to a maximum of 11 million if we have to replace the entire length of pipe to something less than that if we can do a lining. So that project is still in the um, in the feasibility phase and we'll know more about how much we would need to allocate. But in any event, the, um, the remaining ARPA money would not cover the whole project, but it would certainly help. Um, and any, any amount that we don't borrow is that we've been talking a lot about this where the total debt to total revenue, um, if we can use ARPA cash to uh, instead of borrowing, that will always help us in that in that revenue uh, ratio. And so, the other, um, if these projects um, are not appropriate for ARPA or they don't work in, for whatever reason, we um, DPW has identified several other projects that we could use for because water, sewer, stormwater is the major category of investment that we can do. Great. Um, just a question on the Walker Pond category two. Was that? the item initially considered for CPA funds, or is that something that, like you said, with our, they anticipated that they would have some and that we I would that's true. Is share that, the that load? I could ask Karis, yes, Karis both the Department of Public Works director and with the prior CPC right. liaison. The so she has but the that's, most that's, current information. that second hat on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Karis. So um, category one work that is currently 
government funded was not considered eligible by the committee. This work category two, which is actually to improve the water quality in the lake as opposed to the inputs, mm -hmm. um, was considered eligible. So it was originally um, planned to be submitted for CPC this year. Okay. So that frees us up in the CPC fund. Marianne. And uh, just while you're here, could I ask what the status is on the category one work? Do you know? Um, I know that I'm working with a project manager right now in DPW to help uh, liaison between the um, Walker Pond Watershed Association and the town to help communicate about the project a little bit better than we have in the past. Um, and we're currently working with a uh, engineering firm to put together the project. We've also talked with the Conservation Commission director and we do not believe that the work under category one is subject to permitting. Um, so it's a matter of uh, designing and putting out to bid the project. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus? Yeah, so I'm looking um, that all of this is kind of under the ARPA plan, but the dates kind of go past the allotted time that we have to use some of the ARPA funding. So what the ones that go to 2026, isn't it just a few years, a couple of years that we're able to use it? So, so um, the federal government has come out with a new guidance that says okay. as long as the money is committed by the end of 24, okay. you have two more years to finish it. Okay, I did so not know that. So that really only applies to work um, that's construction-based because the okay. money is committed. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, Kate, after we, after we vote this, all right, and it's, we've been having these directional talks for a while about where we think we're going to do this. Is this something that we'll be sharing with, um, for example, the finance committee so that they know which direction we've chosen? Right. So once the board sets a path, yeah. uh, the next step is to forward to the finance committee and um, meet with them and get any feedback. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just note, and I know that the CPC is coming in, but I would be curious if the 356, if that is something that they would take on, and it doesn't sound, you know, I want to have the discussion, but where we would put that money if that were funded from another source. So I'd just be curious after we vote this to look in and see, you know, kind of weigh the two and say, okay, if, if we were to have that, we'd use it for X. And maybe that's a, a reason why it should be CPC, or we say, you know what, it's best to be used here because we don't really have another intention for that. So, and one, one aspect of that is I've asked Karis to look at whether, if it is ARPA funded, it can be, it would positively impact the schedule so that it could be done sooner. Uh, yeah. So, she's working on that. Great. Um, otherwise, if the funding is not available till July 1 or it's at risk through May, um, it's harder to plan. Yeah. Sounds fine. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved um, that the board vote to approve the initial American Rescue Plan funding proposal dated October 26, 2021. Second. Motion and second made. Any discussion? Here we go. We come to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you again, Karis. Karis. Thanks again, Karis. Town manager report. Great. Three quick things. Yes. Um, thanks to our intrepid economic development manager. Um, we have received $25,000 in funding from the state, which is actually technical assistance um, worth $25,000 to um, help us create a marketing plan for the Needham Center businesses. So this is something that um, I think will really help us um, and help the businesses in their planning. And so since we have an item similar to that in the ARPA, that may be um, funds that we could reallocate, or it may be funds that we could use to implement some of the recommendations that are in that. So um, we are very pleased uh, to, to report that to the board today. Two other things. You may recall um, when, I think we're now way back to June of 2020 in that first outdoor town meeting when we had, we were working on the, the children's hospital, um, uh, host community agreement that one of the features of the um, ambulatory facility moving to Needham is that Needham will have um, some access to the determination of need funds that hospitals are required to pay to communities um, through the state department of public health. Now the catchment area is quite wide. It goes all the way up to Framingham. I think it goes south to, to Quincy. Um, so it's a wide area, but uh, we have been meeting. We've been meeting with um, health and human services 
and the schools to really brainstorm what we might be looking to um, ask for money for uh, within the, and this is separate and distinct from the 200,000 a year that would be allocated to need them directly from children's on an annual basis. That's for um, youth services, any kind. Um, so the reason I bring it up is that um, there's an advisory group that um, helps in the process for children's to make its recommendation to the state. And our um, Sarah Shine, our director of youth and family services was invited and will participate on that. So Absolutely. that's really great for us because we really Absolutely. wanted to make sure that we had a voice and um, uh, quite a, a remarkably capable voice of Sarah being on yes. this. It's gonna be really great for us. Great. That's great. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to report is that um, the chair and the vice chair and I had a meeting with representatives of the MBTA basically officially to tell them that we are pursuing the quiet zone um, designation process. They did remind us that um, while they'll do anything they can to help us, um, it is uh, between us and the Federal Railroad Administration, so they don't have as much of a say, um, but they will work with us. And uh, this is particularly true at the area um, of the golf course where the crossing, at the golf club where the crossing is a private crossing between um, some long ago version of the club and some long ago version of the railroad, um, but that they will, they're, they're committed to working with us on that. Um, we are, our design team for the streetscape project is currently designing um, a quiet zone approved treatment at the Great Plain Avenue crossing. And we expect um, that that could be included in the um, construction, which would be no sooner than the summer of 23, um, summer of 23, but that's actually, speed of light um, yeah. when, when you're talking about it. it just so happened that we were working on that area and it just so happened that we could um, allocate chapter 90 funds for that. So more on that, there'll be a lot more conversation on that, but we will be starting the process. Um, once the design is um, submitted by our design team, then these are the things we have to, um, the, the MBTA has to approve it and then it has to go to the federal, rare for, for because the MBTA owns the crossing and then to the FRA for its approval of the, of the quiet. And, and I will be laying out for the board um, a process by which this will all happen because um, the rules aren't, you know, okay, Great Plain Avenue is safe, you don't blow there. You have to wait till you get the whole town. And so there's a lot there. So um, we, we are planning to get you by the end of the calendar year, um, at least a roughed out timeline by which we expect things to occur. Great. It was a good meeting. It was an important meeting to have and uh, yeah, step forward. Marianne? And with that roughed out timeline, will we also have a roughed out cost? Yeah, yes, we have, we, yes, we have a roughed out cost from the 2015 study. We have a cost that the MPTA estimated. We have a cost that the city of Chelsea has been estimating. And then um, we will be updating that with the cost estimate from the design team um, on the existing Great Plain Average, which will probably be the most um, reasonable and accurate cost estimates, so uh, they'll, it'll be most likely be a range of, of what those estimates are. Right. Thank you. Any discussion on that? Okay, that concludes yep. your report. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Can I Marianne. just ask, Kate, did you also talk about um, the, the vibration from the trains? Was that part of the discussion too? With- um, uh, Honeywell, yes. Oh, yes, yeah, they, um, we actually have a meeting with the um, MBTA in the coming weeks where the head of railroad operations is gonna come out to um, the Needham Heights area and see whether there are any meaningful ways. Uh, the, the way the positive train control system that was put in in the last two years has affected the location of the train in the Needham Heights station. Um, so that um, in order not to bring the signal on West Street, the train is further back under the Honeywell Street Bridge and, and really, really, really close um, to um, some of the um, neighbors in homes right on the tracks. So whether there can be a way that those trains can pull further, as they said, into the woods, um, there isn't a lot of woods back there. So um, the Ryan Koholian, who's the director of railroad said he would take a look at whether um, it might be moving a problem or it could make a meaningful impact because further, the further, they called it South as railroad yeah, they South. Call it railroad it's actually south. North. They kept saying railroad South. <laughs> so um, there, are, there are larger buffers and you know, greater distances so, yeah. um, that we, but they were willing to engage us on it because they did understand that 
um, 30 minutes of idling every hour for 12 hours or was it 12? Yeah. Yes. More, more right. than 12. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For 4 a.m. to midnight. Yeah. 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 Like basically is 20 a lot. hours. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've been, um, we've been working with the neighbors in that area to try to see what relief we can get. Thank you. Yeah, and they were open to the idea of coming out and like Kate said, you know, the question is, is the bridge amplifying the sound? So let's look at, and he was much more open than I thought it would be to see if there is a solution, but we'd also want to push it into the neighbors. So Mr. Chair, I would note also, we, we talked about the, the handicapped platforms yes. um, are often in an inconvenient place and do impact where the train stops, but um, you know, the MBTA talks about their infrastructure, like we talk about maybe the Hillside School, which is if they touch it, they have to bring it up completely to code, which for the railroad is at, people can access it um, the entire length of the, of the station. So um, they have, I don't remember how many stations they told us that they would have to, they're chipping away at them and there's something like 25 to 30 million a station to upgrade to fully handicap accessible. So um, that wasn't a quick solution just to move it. Um, they are certainly planning to bring them all up to, to code, but it's gonna take them a while. Right. And thank you to Representative Garlic. I know it's hard yes. to get these appointments, but thank you. Uh, very helpful to sit in the same Zoom room, I guess we would call it, um, and, and see everybody. That beats a trip into Boston, I guess, sometimes. But sometimes that's good to go in and, and have a day. Um, thank you. Um, that brings us to committee reports. I did just want to report that we had a successful town meeting last evening. Um, for those who were able to uh, tune in, you know that for those who were not, um, we passed, uh, the articles were adopted by town meeting, um, the housing, except for the housing um, article was referred back to the planning board uh, for further study. Uh, notable articles uh, were the outdoor dining that we discussed, uh, the demolition of Ridge Hill, um, the Emory Grover uh, design, and then solar at the Jack Cogswell building. So real team effort, as Kate likes to say, team need them, right? Came together, this board, uh, I want to thank obviously the moderator town meeting members um, for being here and just it was nice to be back inside Needham channel for covering it so thanks all the way around uh, to make this effort possible um, it was terrific so uh, and good result as far as the articles that we proposed being passed so um, that's what I have for my committee report any other committee reports okay none um, we'll move then next to motions to go into Executive session under exception three and exception six. If someone could read the full motions, please. Is there a motion? Beyond what you just said, Mr. Chair. Well, I, would, I just I will I, I would move that we go into executive session, not to return to public session, um, to discuss items under exception three, which is strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declared. I so declare. And exception six, to consider the purchase exchange lease or value of real property. If the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the public body. I so declare. Not to return to open session prior to adjournment. Thank you, Ms. Cooley. Is there a second on that second. motion? Okay, we have a motion second. This is done by Roll call vote. Uh, Dan? Yes. Marianne? Yes. Marcus? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you. Good night, everybody.